Heavenly Father, I pray that you will uh, be with me and with those who are listening as I discuss a topic that is in the news, it's timely, it's important, uh, but it's a difficult topic. And for people who have been affected by it or who are close to people who have been directly affected by it, it can be a very painful topic. I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister uh, through this video to people's hearts. Give us wisdom from your word. Help us, Lord Jesus. Amen. So my purpose is to share some thoughts and biblical principles related to the very difficult issue of sexual abuse in churches. So uh, this is prompted by the release of uh, an independent investigation of um, how the Southern Baptist Convention um, responded to some, some uh, cases of reports of sexual abuse. Uh, one of the things that came out in that report was um, allegations against the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, who, until just a couple of days ago, after this this came out, he was serving as as the um, I believe it was as a vice president in the North American Mission Board associated with the Southern Baptist Convention. A very shocking. Um, uh, allegations. Uh, it looks like there's strong corroborating uh, evidence. Of course, he, you know, should have a, a right to present his side of the story, but uh, well, he already resigned from from NAM. And, uh, but this is, but him, his part of the story, his part of the report, Johnny Hunt, um, that was just one small part. I read the report. It's available. Anybody can read it online. Um, this, this, this independent investigation was uh, prompted by concerns that perhaps uh, sexual abuse was not being dealt with well in some areas and at some levels in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so the delegates uh, voted to have an independent investigation. And um, uh, it was a very thorough investigation. They also voted that client attorney privilege would be waived um, so uh, they could get into all of the details of what had happened in these different uh, cases um, and that the investigation would be made public, which it has been. So you can go easily find the investigation online yourself by, by Googling it. It's, it's, it's done by Guidepost. Um, the, the part about... Um, Johnny Hunt, I think, was about 15 pages. The whole investi- the report's about 281 pages. I read through it. It's very difficult reading, not because it's not well written, but because of the, the, the topic. Um, and this is just one small part of, of that report. The report mostly focused on how reports of sexual abuse were handled or, in many cases, um, in the view of the investigators, mishandled by uh, the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. So um, I want to share some of my uh, own ministry experience um, with the issue of sexual abuse. Um, there have been a couple of times uh, that my wife and I have been involved in ministering to victims of sexual abuse. And I know two wonderful ladies who were uh, victims of, of sexual abuse. One of them, my wife and I ministered to extensively, in depth, over a period of uh, years. Uh, sometimes it was, my, my wife's name is Hope, sometimes it was Hope and I together, and sometimes it was just Hope. Um, it was never me by myself, that wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but, uh, but we ministered to this young lady, and, and we saw God do a lot of wonderful work in her life. But it was a long, difficult process. And this wasn't talking about this every day for years, but um, coming, revisiting the issue as it came up, as this person was ready to share, um, as they struggled with it, um, 
uh, a number of times spread over a number of years and um uh and we saw god do a lot of healing and wonderful work in her life there's another lady i know um i was not directly involved in the main part of her healing my role was uh more some encouragement and a lot of prayer but i knew a lot about what was going on in detail again over a period of years she got in this case she got a lot of help through professional christian counseling but there were also other ways that she got help both of these ladies and i hope this will be an encouragement if you have been sexually abused or if you know someone who has been um it was tough the the healing process the the the, the one that we ministered to there was times that she was uh, laying in my ho- in, in, in my wife's lap uh, and, and crying like a little child, just weeping. As she remembered the, and, 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 and processed and, 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 and sought healing for the terrible things that had been done to her. Um, uh, but there was hope. Both of these ladies got a lot of healing, grew in the Lord. They're very mature godly Christians. Um... They're both wonderful, godly mothers. Their own families are, are, are so much more healthy and wonderful than the families that, that, that than what they experienced as children. Um, and, and both of them have been involved in ministries um, uh, that are very, very challenging types of ministries. And they've been fruitful. Um, but this didn't happen overnight. Uh, it was a process of years. So God redeemed the heart and the pain in their life. And, and, and they both of them have used what they experienced now to minister to others and to help them. So, so there is healing. There is hope for people who have been through something uh, like this. Now, the, um, the other type of ministry experience that I have related to this is uh, exposing sexual abuse at a Bible college. I was teaching at a Bible college and... Um, uh, I'm not going to tell the long version of the story, which would be very long, but um, one of the lady students, um, uh, after we discussed uh, at the school, after there was discussion about the issue of sexual abuse, um, she came to my wife for counseling, and over a period of, uh, it was a couple of hours, um, Things came out, and eventually what came out was that uh, an allegation against a um, professor at the, at the Bible college. He was, he was one of the leaders and, and, and a professor there. Um, and for about the next two months, uh, we dealt with that situation, uh, and it was very, very intense. He was eventually... Uh, uh, removed. There was lots of evidence. Uh, he was eventually removed from his position, but the process of from when the first allegation was made to when he was removed, uh, I was right in the middle of all of it, uh, and, and, and my wife was helping, and we, we, we interviewed uh, multiple. There ended up being multiple allegations from different students. We interviewed a lot of them, uh, Hope and I did, and ministered to them, and at the same time, uh, we were uh, gathering uh, um, evidence uh, so that a decision could be made what to do about the man who was accused. The situation was very difficult. Uh, it was a, a painful process for a lot of people. It was made even more difficult by the fact that we were living overseas. Uh, this was at a, a, a Christian Bible college, but Christians were a minority in the nation where we were at, a small minority. The majority of the population was Muslim. Uh, and, um, if this had happened in the United States, based on some of the allegations, uh, it, uh, I, I would have reported it to the police if no one else did. And if those allegations proved true, and I think it's very likely that they would have, um, we wouldn't have had to worry about whether or not to, the school would not have had to worry about, uh, whether or not they should fire him, he would have been put in, in, in prison, I hope. Uh, but in the situation we were in, uh, I did not feel that it was wise to go, for me, 
uh, to go to the police, and the in the in the local leaders of the school uh, did not go that route, and 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 I understand uh, why. Um, so a situation that would have been incredibly difficult and painful if it had happened like in the United States was even more difficult to deal with uh, in that in that setting. Uh, it was a very very painful experience for a lot of people, including. Uh, myself, but I'm I'm not going to share any more uh, details about that. Except that I'm thankful that he was. Uh, it wasn't easy to get to the point of him being removed, but um, he was eventually uh, completely removed from from the school. Um, now, my focus here in this video is on some biblical principles for preventing and responding to sexual abuse in a church or ministry. There's so many ac aspects to this. And even though I, I have some of these experiences I've shared, I'm not an expert. But my strongest point, uh, my strongest area of gifting is teaching the Bible, Bible exposition. So that's what I'm going to focus on in the rest of this video is it's, it's looking at a relevant Bible passage. And this isn't going to address... Um, the all of the details and the detailed recommendations, for instance, that came out of the uh, uh, guy post investigation for the Southern Baptist Convention. Instead, it's going to give broad, deep biblical principles that apply in many situations, in 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 in, in all churches, in in ministry in general. And so, I hope that these will be helpful as people process uh, this difficult issue, since it's going to be in the in the, in the news so much, especially for Christians as and, and, and especially for Christians who uh, worship or serve at a Southern Baptist church, but others will hear about it too. It's all over the secular news and probably will continue to be for a while. So what is sexual abuse? Well, it always involves sexual immorality. Um, I think otherwise it, it wouldn't be sexual abuse. Uh, it might be some other type of abuse. It might be uh, emotional abuse or it might be physical abuse. But obviously, sexual abuse involves some type of sexual immorality, and there's so many types. Uh, but it's not just uh, sexual immorality. It also involves an abuse of power and or authority. So let's imagine a terrible uh, scenario where some pastor is at a club or a bar or something, probably someplace he shouldn't be to begin with by himself, and he meets some woman who's about his age. She doesn't even know he's a pastor. The two of them hook up and uh, they get involved in sexual immorality. Well, that would be sexual immorality. Uh, uh, he should he should he would be disqualifying himself from being a pastor for doing that. But it wouldn't be sexual abuse, assuming that it was totally consensual, because there wouldn't be any issue of uh, a difference in power or authority. Um, if one person is a professor and the other is a student, that's a difference of power and authority, and then it becomes not just, in addition to being sexual immorality, it becomes an issue of sexual um, abuse. Uh, if one person is an employer and the other person works for them, uh, that's an example of, of sexual abuse. Of course, an extreme example is if uh, a man uses his physical strength to force himself on a woman, which, of course, it's, we call that rape, uh, but it's also in the category as one type of sexual uh, abuse. Um, the abuse of a child or youth by an adult is especially severe. The, the child uh, doesn't even know what's normal. They don't know how or where to get help. Uh, the, 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 the adult might be able to control uh, them to a very high degree, uh, so it it does a huge amount of damage to a child's uh, heart and their emotions and their mind when they are um, uh, abused in this way. And 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 like I said, we we've seen some people, and, and they did get healing, but it was a long, painful, difficult process. Um, if you don't, if you haven't been through this. And if you don't know somebody closely and haven't walked with them through this process, it's hard to imagine um, the the amount of courage and strength from God and 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 um, how much how much it costs the person 
to go through this. And, and only with God's help are, are people able to come through something like that and come out healthy and strong and um, um, healed. And even when they're healed, they still carry some, some scars and, and, and there's still sometimes some pain associated uh, with it. It's, 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 it's especially severe. Now, I'm not downplaying abuse uh, when it's, when it's uh, um, adults, uh, like a professor and a student, a college student, um, even though the, 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 the college student is legally an adult, there's still a big difference in power. It's still painful. It still does damage. Um, it may not be as damaging, but it's still a big deal, a very, very big deal. Um, now, an already terrible type of sin is made even worse when it happens in a church or ministry because in the abused person's mind, their uh, faith, their belief, their worship of God gets all entangled in their mind and emotions with the pain and the hurt and the suffering they encountered with abuse. So this can make it very difficult for people who, who, who have been abused uh, to continue to trust in God and, and, and to continue to believe in Him. Thankfully, uh, some do uh, hold on to their faith through all of that, uh, but some walk away from the faith. And um, so, so there's an extra uh, level of heart when it happens in, in, in a church or in a, in a Christian ministry. Now, how can we prevent this terrible sin, and what should we do when there is an allegation that it has a cord? So let's look at some ancient wisdom from the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to turn myself off in terms of you being able to see me on part of the screen, because I really want to focus on the Bible verses at this point. So here we go. Okay, uh, I'll read this passage first, and then we'll go through it. The elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't accept an accusation against an elder unless it is supported by two or three witnesses. Publicly rebuke those who sin, so that the rest will be afraid. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing out of favoritism. Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder, and don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So let's walk through this, but um, I'm going to go kind of roughly backwards, uh, beginning here in verse 22. Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder. Um, so, uh, this is a, this is a, 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 one of the key principles, um, to prevent abuse. And look, even when we do everything right, we are not going to be able to prevent 100% of cases. Sexual predators sometimes are very good at hiding. Sometimes they're very sneaky. Sometimes they're good at presenting themselves as something they're not. Uh, but, but our responsibility is to be on guard and to be diligent and uh, to do the best we can. And if we do that, we might not be, be able to prevent every case, but we can prevent a lot of cases of sexual abuse in churches and in ministries. And so a big part of this is choosing good leaders. And it says, don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder. And that's in 1 Timothy 5.22. Back in 1 Timothy 3, Paul emphasizes two areas to pay attention to. Uh, when, when, when choosing someone for any position of ministry leadership. This is especially focused on elders, but very similar qualifications are for deacons, and uh, certainly would apply to anyone who we were going to allow to minister to our children. And the first area is character. Um, uh, so, so, so Paul doesn't say anything about how much money they have or how highly educated they are or how popular they are or how charismatic their personality is. Um, he, 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 he talks a lot about the importance of them having good godly character. And then the second thing he talks about is are they leading their own family well? Because 
if they're not leading their own family well, why would we trust them with God's family, with our church family? And, um, and, and, and so if we carefully check on these things before we put someone in a, in a, in a position of ministry leadership um, or, or, or ministry with children, um, any type of position like that, uh, it will help a lot. Now, it's not enough to not know of any problems. You should have strong reasons to believe that they are uh, godly, mature uh, Christians. Um, let's, uh, uh, so, uh, let, me, let me talk about uh, a couple of different ways that this can be put into practice. Um, if it's somebody who's in your church and in your church family, and they've been in your church family for years, and you know them, you've been in their house, you know their family, you're close to them. Well, the process may feel fairly easy. Really, what's happened is the process has already occurred over a period of years of knowing this person. And um, uh, and, 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 and then, you know, it may, may be a relatively short process to, to check, you know, to see if there's anything. Uh, it, you know, especially if they're working with children, I think it's a good practice to do a, a background check but that's not going to find out even as much, you know, just to make sure they didn't have some criminal record nobody knows about before they moved to your town or something like that. But um, but that's not going to reveal as much as knowing them in, in person. So that's a, a, a really good, um, that's a really good way to do this. Now, if you're hiring someone for the church, like let's say you're hiring a pastor who's who would be moving into the area, then then you need to be diligent to do background checks to check, to ask him a lot of hard questions, but also to do character references where you call and you talk to people. And sometimes it's good to ask the references for other references um, and, and because you don't personally know this person. Uh, so you need to really do diligence and, and, and check to see that they have good godly character, that there's no big red warning flags, uh, Certainly, you, a criminal background check is a very good idea. I would say that uh, in this day and age, uh, certainly if you live in a country like the U.S., you should certainly do that if, the, uh, if you don't know the person personally, and sometimes even if you do. Um, and, um, and, and just do due diligence to try to make sure that we don't let wolves uh, into the sheep pen. Um, now, in some examples in the investigation, Churches appear to have failed miserably in following Paul's advice. Uh, they they didn't do good checks. Uh, they and 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 they hired people who had already previously uh, abused other people. And if they had done more checking, they probably could have found that out in some cases. Um, so it's important to be diligent. There is a constant pressure. To, to find leaders and people who can serve in churches. Um, the people who are choosing them are often stretched thin. Uh, people on pastor search committees are usually volunteering. They don't have a lot of experience with it a lot of times. Uh, they have full-time jobs. They have families. But it's important to give some time to do this right. Because however much it costs in terms of time and effort to do it right, it's nothing compared to the price you'll pay if you don't get it right. Um, so it's important to take time to do this well. Okay. Uh, okay, but what if, even though we tried to be careful, there's an accusation of sexual abuse? And this happens. Some of the people, um, you know, it, 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 it's not because the shorts didn't uh, vet them well. Like I said, uh, wolves can sneak in, and, and also people who seem to be good, Maybe there's something off inside them, but it doesn't manifest until later, uh, and, and, and they fall into a, a terrible sin and do terrible damage to other people. So what happens then? Well, let's go up to verse 19. Don't accept an accusation against an elder unless it is supported by two or three uh, witnesses. Now, I'm going to talk about the two or three witnesses in a minute, but I think this is pointing to the fact that there needs to be a careful investigation. In other words, um, uh, just because somebody s says that a pastor or other leader did something, you don't automatically believe it. You need to look into it 
carefully and see if there was any supporting uh, evidence. Now, if the allegations, uh, if the alleged a- actions are crime, uh, you should call the police. And and so, if the sexual abuse involves an adult abusing um, a minor, um, that's a crime. And look, the if if, if one church member is alleged to have uh, murdered another church member. Uh, the elders or the deacons wouldn't try to take care of that on their own. I hope um, they may have. They might still have a role of ministry, a lot of ministry to the family that was hurt, even to the even to the person who was accused. They might have a lot of ministry, but um, uh, th- hopefully they wouldn't try to handle it on their own. That would be crazy. It is just as crazy to try to handle a case of alleged uh, uh, child sexual abuse because that's a serious crime. It's a very serious crime. And look, uh, the, uh, uh, deacons, elders, they uh, churches do not have all of the resources or the authority that the police have. The church can't get a subpoena or a warrant and go into the accused person's house uh, with guns drawn if you have to. If they, don't want, if they don't want to let you in and you have a warrant, the police can force themselves in if, if, if it comes to it. Forcibly take their laptop and give it to a forensic expert to find out if there's evidence on it, uh, and, and, and and do other things like that. The police have a lot of power uh, given to them by the state, uh, and it's their job. It's their God-given job to, to do this. So if the alleged actions are a crime, call the police. In fact, I recommend if you suspect that uh, there is a, uh, a sexual abuse of a child, that you immediately go to the police, that you don't delay at all. That may mean that you go to the police first or that you go to the police like the same day that you tell your elder or pastor uh, you know, that you suspect somebody in the church of, of, of doing this. Um, you need to get the police involved. Uh, experience has shown that when people don't go to the police, it's much less likely to go well. Okay. Uh, but sometimes we will need to investigate the best we can and make our own judgments. Um, for example, let's say that somebody accuses a pastor in your church. Um, uh, maybe maybe it's a, a music minister. Um, and let's say that he's uh, 45 years old and they accuse him of having sex with a 19-year-old girl in your church. Well, that's a terrible, terrible sin if it's true, but it's not illegal. The police are not going to investigate that and, unless, unless there was evidence that he, he forced, if it was non-consensual, if it was, uh, uh, you know, rape, then the police will investigate it. But uh, if, 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 um, if, if it was not uh, uh, rape, the police aren't going to investigate it, but it still needs to be investigated by the church. And we are able to do this and do it well with God's help. Look at what Paul said about this. If any one of you has a dispute against another, how dare you take it to court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Now you might think, hold on a minute. You just said to call the police. This is, 1 Corinthians 6 is especially talking about a civil case, I believe. It's not talking about if you know somebody who killed somebody else or something like that um, or uh, in, in, like in the setting of the United States, where thankfully uh, crimes against children are, are taken very seriously, and, and many other countries as well. Um, uh, so, 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 yes, you should call the police, but if you have a civil dispute in the church with a Christian, then you can settle it uh, with the help of the church, hopefully. Um, don't you know that saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the trivial cases? Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So there may be many cases where the church needs to investigate something, and maybe because of the nation you're in, like the story I told, or, or maybe because it involves a serious sin, but it does not involve a legal crime, the church has to do the investigation. And the church needs to have confidence that its leaders, uh, people appointed by its leaders, sometimes its leaders may ask help from other uh, Christians outside in some cases, uh, 
but but that Christians can do a good job. Christian leaders can do a good job um, investigating and making judgments when it's our responsibility to do so. And sometimes it will be our responsibility uh, to do so. And 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 God will God will help us when we need to do that. Um, and, and we should take that responsibility seriously and do it. Um, now, it's, what's this thing about two or three witnesses? How can there be two or three witnesses for sexual abuse? Sexual abuse almost always occurs in private, and the abuser is very careful most of the time for it to happen, where it's just the two of them and no one else is going to see. I mean, it's ext- <laughs> I mean, there's not going to be an eyewitness standing there during the actual act. So, so how do you get um, uh, two or three uh, witnesses? Um, well, in the case at the Bible College, um, the way that we got multiple witnesses was we found other victims. And um, people who are sexually abusing people, not always, sometimes there's just one victim, but very often they do this to more than one person. And you pray and you look, if it's, like I said, if it's a crime, the police should be doing this. <coughs> um uh, but but maybe but the shorts can be involved too. You look for for other uh, victims. In our case, we we asked the first victim if if she thought anyone else might have experienced something similar, and she gave a couple of names, and then those people gave names, and those people gave names. Oh my goodness, we ended up with it was a terrible situation. How many people? He hadn't done the same thing to all of them. In some cases, it would fall in. in it, a fair number of the cases would fall in the category of what we would call sexual harassment, still very serious, but not sexual abuse. Some of them were in the category, I, I feel like, of sexual abuse. But anyways, so one way to get more than one witness is if, even though only one person was there for each event, multiple people are accusing him of something similar. Uh, another way to get multiple witnesses, I think that we can apply this to mean independent pieces of evidence. So for instance, if, if the victim is giving their testimony, that's one piece of evidence. And then if they have texts from the person uh, on their cell phone, you could kind of count that, I think, as a second piece of evidence. Even though it's not a person, it's still a type of witness. Um, and often God will help to find corroborating evidence um, in these cases. Often there's corroborating evidence. Evidence. Now, if it really comes down to there's absolutely no corroborating evidence, also the person might confess, in which case that's a second witness. But if there's really no corroborating witness evidence at all, and if um, the person denies, the, the accused person denies that it happened, then you can't treat them, you, you need a lot of wisdom. Uh, uh, you, 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 you need a lot of wisdom in those cases. Um you want to be cautious, but at the same time, you don't want to treat them as guilty. I haven't been in a situation like that actually, but um, uh, but the but it, you know it can happen. There's one case. It's not something I'm free to talk about. That's a little bit like that uh, that I had to deal with. The the stories I told you, my experiences with ministering to people and 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 dealing with this aren't the only times I've been involved. There's uh, another really, really heartbreaking case, but it, um, uh, it's not one that I'm going to talk about now. Um, okay, uh, godly wisdom is needed, so is God's help, and here's the good news. God gives wisdom, God gives us help when we are in these situations. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but God helps us. So what should the church do if there is enough evidence to conclude that a leader has sexually abused someone? Well, obviously they should be fired. Uh, I, 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 I hope that's obvious. Um, uh, you know, if they sexually abused someone, um, uh, you know, they should, be, they, they, they should be removed from their position. And, and if it was a crime, if it was against a child, for example, or if it involved rape, if it was forced, Hopefully, a judge will send them to jail. But there's more to it. There's more to it. First Timothy 5.20, publicly rebuke the, those who sin so that the rest will be afraid. So what might this look like? Well, it's going to vary depending on the situation. Um, 
I think in general, uh, the person's position, if they are in leadership over a whole church, like if they're an elder or if they're the senior pastor, um, then I, I think that the whole church should be told um, if they're not in that type of leadership position, then the people who are potentially affected or were under their ministry or had children in their ministry like that, anyone affected or under them, I think, should be told. But you're going to need godly wisdom in who is told and how much do you tell. Um, obviously, you don't have to um, uh, get into all of the ugly details, but you need to tell enough so that the, the, the short understands um, how serious the sin was and the basic nature of the sin. Uh, also, publicly, I think what this means is that the information should be available so that this person can't go and do it somewhere else. Um, and, and exactly how you're going to do that is going to vary case to case. Of course, if it's a criminal issue, then there'll be a criminal record. But um, many churches have failed here. They want to handle it quietly. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that churches and ministries made. A number of churches that are mentioned in the investigation, the guidepost investigation, uh, made this mistake. Um, they want to sweep it under the rug. They're trying to protect the reputation of the church. Or sometimes they're more concerned about the abuser than they are about the, the, the damage he's done or the damage he might do in the future. And when they handle it quietly, so many times the person goes somewhere else and abuses more people. It's a terrible mistake to sweep it under the rug. Um, how, however painful it is to, um, to deal with it uh, and to do this public rebuke, it's very difficult. It's very, very uncomfortable. But if you don't do it, it's going to the whoa, it's going to be way worse down the road. It's going to be way worse. This is really hard. It's really hard to do it right. So do we have to do it? Well, Paul really emphasizes, yes, we have to do it. Look at the next verse. I, right after he says this, he says, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to absorb these things without prejudice, doing nothing out of favoritism. No matter how much you like that leader, no matter how popular he was, no matter how much influence he has, no matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how worried you are about, will people stop tithing to the church? Will we lose people? You better do it because you better not be primarily afraid of how the people are going to react. You better think about God. You better think about the Lord Jesus Christ. You better think about the elect angels. Yes, you have to do this, even though it's uncomfortable, it's painful, and it's difficult. What happens when churches have failed to do this? I already talked about that. Often the person goes on to do more abuse. Uh, so public rebuke and jail are not the worst problems an abuser faces. I just want to point this out quickly. If the church doesn't deal with it well, don't think that they're going to get away with it in the long run because they're going to have to answer to God. This is what Jesus said. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. I definitely think this applies to people who sexually abuse others. Uh, judgment Day is coming. I'm not saying that they can't be forgiven and have eternal life. Um, Paul uh, murdered Christians before he became a Christian, and he was forgiven. So it, as terrible as the sin is, it can be forgiven. But, they, but if they're not, not forgiven, terrible, terrible judgment is coming their way. God takes it very seriously. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, what happens when a leader goes bad. But Paul talks about good leaders before he talks about bad ones in this passage. Remember, most Christian leaders are good leaders. The elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Look, I've been involved in dealing with some wolves in sheep's clothing, with some terrible leaders who did terrible damage. Um, it hurts. It's terrible. And then news reports come out and and, and, and investigations like this happen. And there's a lot of focus put on the leaders who blew it, people who we trusted, and they turned out to be uh, 
that to, at the very least, to have blown it in a huge way on some occasion. And in some cases, they're just outright predators. Um, and and that, that can really cause us to lose trust in Christian leaders. Of course, we, we should never put our absolute or ultimate trust in human Christian leaders. Our absolute trust is in Jesus Christ. But most Christian leaders are good leaders. I've been involved in ministry for many years. I'm 57 years old, um, most of my adult life. Uh, I, I've worked with many leaders literally around the world in many different settings. The vast majority of Christians in ministry, in professional ministries, are good, godly people. Many of them are serving sacrificially. Many of them um, are living humble lifestyles. They could definitely have made more money and had a more comfortable lifestyle for themselves and their family if they had used their equivalent amount of skills and effort and education in some other field other than professional ministry. Many of them are not the ones doing harm. They're on the front line. And whenever somebody's loved one dies, or whenever somebody has fallen into some pit of sin and darkness, or whenever somebody has been hurt or wounded, these Christian leaders are there for them, ministering to them, loving them, reaching them with the love of Jesus, uh, bringing God's love and truth and promises into the darkness. Uh, so most Christian leaders, and I'm convinced of this, like I said, I've seen the bad ones. I'm not naive. Uh, but in my experience, uh, 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 and I'm talking about true Christians, uh, in, in, in my experience is with theologically conservative evangelical Christians. I don't have very much experience with people outside of that category. But in that category, most Christian leaders are good, godly leaders. So keep that in mind. That's important to keep balanced. Uh, we don't want to ignore the, the problems with the bad ones, but we, we, we don't want to let that color our view of all Christian leaders. Okay, I'm going to try to pop back in here. Here we go. Okay, there's so much we haven't covered. I want to share a few final thoughts uh, quickly before I uh, wrap this up. Okay, um, my view of the guidepost investigation report and recommendations. Um, I've been serving um, in as a pastor in a pastor role in Southern Baptist churches um, since early 2011, so for about 11 years now. Um, and before that, uh, we served the Lord overseas for 14 years. Um, but I am not into the national level or even the state level. Um, convention organizations. I, I think those are they're needed. They're important. They do important ministries by cooperating. Southern Baptists support a lot of missions and a lot of ministry that that sh individual churches could not do on their own. So those things are valuable, and we need people who invest in that. And we need people in the seminaries that that, that train people or under the umbrella of the Southern Baptist Convention. So we, we, we need good, godly people who care about these national organizations and state conventions. And I'm thankful for people who that's part of their ministry. I have just a tiny amount of involvement in that part of ministry. I'm thankful for other people who are called to it. So I want to say that I, am not, I do not feel like I have a really well-informed opinion of the details of this specific investigation and their recommendations. But for what it's worth, if you're interested... Uh, I did read through the long report. I have followed these issues some. Uh, and, and, and as I shared at the beginning, I do have, I'm not like a, a, some people, like their whole profession has to do with ministering to people in situations like this. I'm not like that, but I, I have had a fair amount of experience with uh, um, both victims of sexual abuse and dealing with it in, in difficult ministry situations. So I'll share my opinion for what it's worth, and I pray that God will give you wisdom. Um, I think the guidepost investigation, my feeling is that it was good, it was helpful. Uh, I think it was well presented. It looks like it was well done. And I feel like, to me, it looks like most of the recommendations are going in the right direction. I don't know about all the details and exactly how to implement everything, and, um, uh, but I feel like it's going in the right direction for what that's worth. But my main role at that level is just going to be praying 
for the people who are making those decisions? How do we implement changes to do things better? Um, and uh, uh, and what should we do and what shouldn't we do? I pray that God will give people wisdom. Now, uh, I love this Bible verse. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. In this video, I focused on some biblical principles that Paul gave us that can um, protect against uh, sexual abuse in churches and ministries. You're not, you're not going to 100% eliminate it, even when you're doing things right. Um, sometimes the enemy will sneak in, um, but but you can you can guard. You can reduce a lot of. Uh, you can protect a lot of people from sexual abuse if you do things right. I focused on that, and I focused on what do you do when there is an allegation of sexual abuse and how to deal with it. Some biblical principles um, that are so important. I have I've talked about the fact that God heals people, but I haven't talked about how that happens. And I might make another video on that. Um, I'm not a professional counselor, but when, where we were at overseas, there were not professional counselors. <laughs> if Hope and I didn't do it, uh, there were not professional Christian counselors, not available where we were. Um, and uh, it was <laughs> a very challenging setting. Um, and, and, and if anyone was going to help people who were hurt by this, I mean, it was us or nobody. Um, and so we, it's not that we thought that we were like super well equipped for this. We... We prayed, we read books, we got counsel from other Christians, we got input from Christians who were professionals in these areas, and we did the best we could, and God walked through us, and, 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 and we saw people healed. Uh, the, the, the one lady I talked about, but we also helped some others. Um, and, uh, and so I might share some ideals about how God walks in the lives of those who have been hurt to find healing and, and, and to come out strong and and for that heart to be redeemed so that they can then minister to other people. Uh, just reviewing quickly what we've learned, what I've shared in this video, we must be careful in appointing leaders. Some churches have not been, and sometimes they get kind of lucky or God blesses them despite their carelessness. Other times it ends in terrible disaster. Uh, suspected sexual abuse should be carefully investigated. Yes, there does have to be evidence if we're going to treat someone as guilty, of course. Uh, but 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 it needs to be carefully investigated. Uh, if it's criminal by the police, uh, if not, then the church needs to step up and, 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 and do what needs to be done. We must not sweep it under the rug where there is evidence that there's been sexual abuse. There has to be a, a public acknowledgement of that. And by the way, the public rebuke, it doesn't mean you're yelling at the person or something like that, but you're revealing, uh, not like I said, not all the ugly details, you have to be very careful not to reveal things that are going to hurt the people who were the victims. Usually, unless the victims want their their testimony and their names attached, normally you don't reveal the, the identity of the victims. Um, but uh, we must not sweep it under the rug. God can heal those who have been crushed. This is so important. There is healing in Jesus Christ. And uh, if you've been hurt, uh, look for mature godly Christians who will be who will listen to you and care about you. If the first one or two or three aren't like that, find someone else. Sometimes, uh, and if you are living in, the, in a country like the United States, this is available. Sometimes uh, it's good to go to a professional Christian counselor. Um, they, I, I know people have been helped a huge, tremendous amount by professional Christian counseling. Uh, but God has many different ways to heal people. And then just the, the practices, the spiritual disciplines of being in his word and prayer and Christian fellowship do bring some amount of healing over time, but it needs to be dealt with specifically as well. And then remember, most Christian leaders, certainly true Christians, and like I said, my experience what that I can give testimony to is uh, evangelicals. Um, most evangelical Christian leaders are good, godly people. Most of them are not wolves in sheep's clothing. I want to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give wisdom to people who right now and over the coming weeks and months are going to be making decisions uh, with respect to the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the Executive Committee, the, the Committee on Credentials, and, 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 and how, we are, how we can do better. And give wisdom 
concerning uh, how we can do better consistent with um, our structure where churches do have a lot of autonomy and we believe that's the way it should be, that churches are autonomous. Um, but we cooperate together and there's things that can be done. Uh, help us not just to worry about the things we can't do, but to think about the things we can. Help us not to prioritize protecting ourselves, but to prioritize protecting uh, potential victims and bringing healing and protection and help and restoration to those who have already been hurt. Lord, I pray that you will be with everybody who is called to have some role in dealing with this. And then, Lord, for the victims. Oh, God, I pray that for every one of them you'll bring healing, that you'll pour in your love and grace into the hearts that have been broken and crushed. Help them, Lord, I pray. Bring them healing. Help them to find the right places to find healing and help. Give them grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be with everyone who heal, he, heals this, and watches this video, and bless it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.